Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, the non-ending of the war on Afghanistan, the ramping up of the Cold War on China, and the Black Alliance for Peace. Our guest, Julie Baruguiz, has served in an advisory role for the Black Alliance for Peace since it was founded in 2017. She also is the coordinator of the Black Alliance for Peace's Solidarity Network. Julie Varghese, they've been ending the war on Afghanistan for a decade or so now. Uh, is it actually ending? It looks like it's not ending, um, and I don't think anybody should be surprised by that. Um, the, uh, the war has been mostly privatized, was mostly privatized even before Biden announced the withdrawal plans for September, for September 11th. And um, now it's going to be, it looks like it's going to be completely privatized. And, uh, and this is, uh, you know, um, it's all around a violation of the U.S. Taliban agreement that was uh, brokered last year. It's, it's a violation of international laws. So it's um, the United States just being a rogue state as usually you're referring to an agreement uh, made when Trump was president, and now President Biden doesn't uh, feel inclined to abide by that agreement. Is that right? Right, and um, that's that's a, a bit ironic because Democrats have been had been um, really going in hard on Trump when he withdrew from the climate agreement, when he withdrew from uh, the JCPOA, and uh, Biden before coming into office said, "Oh yeah, I'll." Uh, you know, uh, the United States will, uh, you know, get back into all these agreements to worry about it. Um, the JCPOA actually is still not, uh, the United States is still not a party to it. Um, and, um, and then when it happened with the U.S. Taliban agreement, people are not really looking at the fact that you, once you say, if the, if the withdrawal agreement says that the de- withdrawal date is May 1st, and you just don't even acknowledge that and just say, we're, you know, the United States is going to you know, leave on September 11th, you know, that, that, that is, that's the violation of the agreement. In fact, the Taliban at that time was so angry that they just were, just refused to take part in talks uh, immediately after that with the U.S.-backed Afghan government. And um, it's just, uh, yeah, it's just world behavior by the United States. Didn't, didn't Biden say we're going to start withdrawing troops on May 1st, but it's going to take us until September 11th to, to finish, which worked out to like, I don't know, 15 troops a day or something at the rate it would take to withdraw them from May 1st to September 11th. It's sort of a pretense that he was somehow complying with, the, with that date. Yeah, so starting to withdraw on May 1st is still not in compliance with the agreement because the agreement said the troops are supposed to be out by May 1st. But also, um, there's a lot of symbolism here where if you're saying that the first, um, that all troops will be out by September 11th, you're kind of retying Afghanistan back to the 9-11 attacks that happened almost 20 years ago. So, and again, Afghanistan had nothing to do with the 9-11 attacks. In fact, back then, the Taliban said, we need proof that that Al-Qaeda and, um, and uh, Osama bin Laden are hiding out here before we let you into the country. And the United States wouldn't give proof. So um, they were like, well, then you can't show up here. And uh, they were like, well, we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> so uh, yeah, rogue state behavior. So, I mean, Afghanistan had no more to do with it than Germany or Maryland or various other places. It was just a place where people had allegedly plotted the the crimes of September 11th, right? Um, that's what they're saying is that um, you know Osama bin Laden was hanging out, was hiding there, um, and uh, you know, like even if a, a country is like, you know, we don't, we need to see proof, and you know, that you would think then you'd want to be like, okay, so you know, this is what we're, this is the proof that we have. Um, can we work together? That might have been 
you know, can these two countries work together? That could have been a thing, but they didn't even do anything like that. But it's just, um, again, it just comes back to this whole like, idea of the symbolism of 9-11 where Biden gets to actually tie it back to 9-11. Right. With, and, and, and it's like a, like, it's almost like saying, yay, the war has been won, but actually the United States has been losing that war. I mean, in Afghanistan, I mean, Taliban controls most of that country, and there's been outpost after outpost being taken over, surrendering, being surrendered to the Taliban by Afghanistan right. because they can't handle it without U.S. backing. And, and of course, Al-Qaeda isn't just a small number of people in caves in Afghanistan anymore. Through the war against terrorism, they've uh, now got thousands of, of branches all over Africa and Asia, right? Um, no, I'm not going to comment too much on that. I will say, though, that the, the argument that the United States uses that there's terror groups springing up all over Africa is, is also problematic because it's, the United States has been using that argument to then deploy troops there, uh, set up bases there, set up military to military uh, relationships with different countries in Africa. In fact, 53 out of 54 African countries have military to military, some type of relationship with the United States. That's problematic for the people, the, the ordinary working masses and for people of Africa. It's not so much a problem for the neo-colonial puppets uh, you know, who are in power. All right, but my point is that it's counterproductive that first the troops move into an area in Africa and then the resistance and the terrorism follows. The, the, yes, the, yes. the sequence is in the reverse order. Uh, from what we're we're told, the, the the troops are going to where the terrorists are. It's it's the other way around. Yeah. So I mean, that's why I mean that I mean the Black Lives the Black Lives Peace's position is that the United States has no business in Africa. Period. And that the fact that there's um, more resistance from the people, and sometimes it shows up in the form of militant groups, that just shows right there that there's that. The United States is the problem there. But the United States, really, all it's been doing is military operations because it has nothing to offer Africa. Uh, you know, people keep talking about China as a problem. You know, Russia's you know showing up; it's a problem. But really, the biggest problems in Africa are uh, the, is, is the pan-European colonial project, and that um, relates to that's the United States and that's France, um, and it's going to continue being that way until the people of Africa. Um, get all those powers out of the uh, continent. And when you when you say that the war on Afghanistan has been privatized, uh, explain what you mean. Well, before Biden announced the uh, withdrawal plans, it was already a seven to one ratio of mercenaries and so called pri private contractors to the uh, soldiers that were publicly funded. Um, that's what, and, you know, and some of them are like, you know, cafeteria workers, some of them may be like, you know, civilians or whatever, but it's a privatized operation and actually they're planning to keep some of them there. There's no plan to, to, um, move them out. And, uh, actually there's been like death squads trained by the CIA already in, in Afghanistan that the people are terrified of. And, uh, and, you know, the U S was trying to find a, a base right outside of Afghanistan that they could use in another country to continue to attack Afghanistan, which would also be another violation of, you know, the U.S. Taliban agreement, which says that you're not supposed to attack, the United States is not supposed to attack Afghanistan um, after, you know, from inside the country or from outside the country, and it's not supposed to try to subvert the process underway to put the country together, that the people's process to put the country back together. So... Um, that would all be inviolable. So in, in, trying to attack the country from outside on, in a base outside of the country would have been a violation. But the United States apparently doesn't seem to be able to find a, a base close to Afghanistan, right on the border. Uh, it looks like Pakistan is uh, still offering to allow uh, drones to be launched or the use of the airspace. And, um, but they're saying that they're not going to allow uh, it's not clear yet if they're going to allow the U.S. to build a whole U.S. military base, which would the people of Pakistan then would be in an uproar. And of course, the people in, across the border in Afghanistan would be in an uproar also over that. 
So for now, it looks like the U.S. is trying to use its Gulf region air bases to launch attacks. Um, but it, it's also part of like the United States' um, kind of, it, it wants to keep the area destabilized for a number of reasons, and partly because it wants to keep China from being able to build that Belt and Road, Initi Belt, Belt and Road Initiative, which could have gone to Afghanistan, um, and it's now just kind of going above Afghanistan. Um, so it's just kind of like, and also there's like this issue of extremists, and where if the place is disabled, if Afghanistan is destabilized, and um, for example, uh, you know, there's the whole thing about Xinjiang and the, um, the uh, what do you call the, uh, people supposedly being detained in these concentration camps. So um, there's this East Turkmenistan Islamic movement that, that, uh, that the United States does not recognize as a terror organization. Um, and uh, it's trying, it's been doing, it's been, uh, you know, yeah, I guess kicking off riots or that just kind of causing trouble in uh, Xinjiang, which they refer to as East Turk Turkestan. And, um, it's, it makes sense for like the United States to not to deny that this group exists because then it then it doesn't have to acknowledge that China has a reason for detaining somebody. It's been China's been trying to uh, stop uh, terrorism in Asia since before 9/11, and it's and because there is these uh, groups that are trying to um, kind of cause um, issues, and they happen to be um, you know. Uh, uh, adherence of a, a, a very extreme type of Islam that um, comes out of Wahhabism. And a lot of these people who are like um, involved, sometimes they're from Arab countries, sometimes they're from the Arab the Arabian Peninsula or from Egypt. They can be from all over, but they're somehow ending up in Afghanistan. So they're, they've been referred to as the Afghan um, Arabs to distinguish yeah. them from like the people who are in Afghanistan. And uh, similarly, so it's the same thing happening in China, where there's this, um, there's this bit a ter there's been a terror threat for decades, and they're trying to get a hold of it by uniting with countries across the country, uh, the continent. And um, the United States just um, says, uh, and, and, you know, the United States, the, the U.S. population is not aware of this, so it's it's really our job to make people in the West aware of the fact that there's it's not just terrorists that the United States are fighting. It's it, this is like across the board, and they're 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 springing up because of decades, centuries of colonialism, and uh, you know these neo-colonial puppets that get put up like the Saudi family, and then um, and then and then you know then you have you know really extremist people showing up, and and you know Osama bin Laden like there's like a whole history with him, so it's like. Um, I mean, it all comes back to, you know, what did these pan-European colonial powers do that had it so that, you know, these uh, groups spring up and then it's, uh, places are destabilized and, uh, and then the United States will talk about fighting terrorism. So it's uh, a bit ironic. And, and the United States, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, is going to keep funding and arming and training the Afghan government, uh, as well as threatening missiles and bombs from the air and whatever mercenaries and CIA and so-called special forces can remain. So it's, it, it doesn't really look like the, the ending of a war or the, the getting your forces out of the region at all. Well, they're trying to keep a hold of that central government that's still in place that's U.S.-backed. Um, but the United States really doesn't have much of a foothold in Afghanistan. It is, in fact, it was dismantling its bases in Afghanistan and just tossing the materials, the, the equipment, without taking them apart, without recycling them, without figuring out another place for them to go. So you're talking about terrorists, but you're leaving behind your, your equipment that anybody could use now in any direction. Um, sure. They're... They're trying to keep a, a foothold, it seems, in Kabul itself, the, the uh, capital of the country, and um, trying to keep uh, 600 soldiers or 600 military personnel to guard that U.S. embassy there. Um, I, I think that it's just, it just seems like it's, they're just trying to keep the city, the capital, that they can also fly in and out of, uh, free for the United States. But uh, the rest of the country is a, it's a whole different ballgame. 
Well, the one the one good uh, silver lining is that all the women of Afghanistan have been liberated and given freedom by the U.S. and NATO, right? Um, you would. I mean, that's the that's the myth, but um, it, it 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 it's not the case at all. I mean, you know, real liberation would be being able to determine how you live and um, struggling through it with your with your. Uh, your relatives in your homeland, not with the uh, colonizer coming in from outside, you know, deciding to set up bases, uh, causing disruption. Um, you know, there have been uh, there there have been times in the past where Afghan women were allowed to go to school. It was, I mean, it did start definitely with the Taliban banning women and girls from uh, going to school and being outside of their house without a, a male, uh, super, you know, kind of male partner or husband or whatever with them. But the thing, though, is that um, it doesn't, the United States being there doesn't make it any better. Like, their situation is not any better. Afghan women who are inside the country and outside the country, you know, except for the ones who end up being in parliament, the few people, for the rest of people uh, who are, for the rest of women, it's not like, I mean, they will tell you it's not any better. It's actually... It's so violent there. It's so destructive there. The, the, the war happening and then the, the backfire between the different groups that you can't you can't live a safe life. You can't do what you need to do, and that's why there are so many refugees outside of Afghanistan in neighboring countries, and of course in Europe and in the United States. Yeah, uh, we're speaking with Julie Varghese, who is with Black Alliance for Peace, and Julie, I'm asking all about Afghanistan because Black Alliance for Peace uh, began sending out a newsletter on the topic with all kinds of great resources. Uh, can you tell us uh, about the newsletter and about what Black Alliance for Peace is working on? Yes, yeah, so uh, the Black Alliance for Peace um, has always had uh, non-African supporters uh, since its uh, founding, but we've officially put the supporters, the non-African supporters together into an organization called the Solidarity Network in August of last year. Um, since then, it has grown by leaps and bounds. We've more than doubled the amount of people who are now in the uh, organization. And uh, since almost the beginning, it's been, um, you know, the, the, the Africans who lead the Black Alliance for Peace asked the Solidarity Network, you know, to please work on the Afghanistan issue. So uh, we actually did a number of things. We uh, did an International Day of Action on Afghanistan on April 8th. Um, we have been putting out fact sheets on different items, such as what is the, you know, breaking down what is the U.S. Taliban agreement, breaking down what are U.S. tensions in Afghanistan, and uh, etc. Uh, we have a page on our website called blackalliancefortpeace.com slash Afghanistan. And um, beyond that, uh, you know, we did a webinar on April 29th which was called Mayday Afghanistan, Building a People's Movement to End U.S. Imperialism in Afghanistan and around the world. So the, the uh, inside of the Solidarity Network, we have a small group called the Afghanistan Committee. The Afghanistan Committee puts, does the, the work on these uh, fact sheets and um, helping uh, organize the webinar. And, uh, and then we decided to do a newsletter because uh, it seems like there's not much information or analysis out there coming from an anti-imperialist from an anti-imperialist perspective in the United States on Afghanistan. And the Afghanistan issue has, have, has gotten kind of quiet, has quieted down a bit since yeah. Biden's uh, announcement. So we um, we just thought it was, you know, something to keep, it's a way to do a new monthly newsletter would be a way to keep it in people's minds, be, I mean, provide a service to people so they can understand. Because nowadays, it's just going to be a bunch of mainstream articles. There's not much uh, anti-imperialist or alternative perspectives that are anti-imperialist coming out. So what we do is that we would, we basically, in that first newsletter, took all these mainstream, mostly mainstream articles and uh, provided some analysis below them. Or, or uh, we provided analysis and then we linked to these like mainstream articles. Um, but that way, even if you, uh, even if like you don't read the article, you read the summary, you read the, the, the analysis. 
Uh, and similarly, if you don't know much about the United States' uh, wars around the world and imperialism, you get a sense of it. You get educated just by spending five, ten minutes reading that newsletter. And um, we've gotten a lot of in that we we uh, put it out last year, last week, and we've gotten a lot of um, uh, I, what was it? Hoorays. <laughs> we got a lot of like you know like thank you for putting this out from people. Right. in the movement and um, people appreciate it and uh, we're, so we're going to continue doing it for every month and you know people ask why is the Black Alliance for Peace doing this um, you know because there are a lot of issues that concern Africans in the continent and in that diaspora within the Americas in Europe etc so why is you know, the Alliance for Peace specifically um, trying to uh, work on Afghanistan and, and for us it's like uh, because we're internationalists, it it doesn't matter where U.S. imperialism is putting down its feet and and causing destruction to us. Wherever they're doing it, it's connected to the same destruction that's happening in African communities all throughout the world, in the continent and, and in the diaspora, and to and for other people. So you know, we also talk about Palestine a lot in our newsletters. We talk about um, you know, and we always try to connect all these uh, points, we try to connect Afghanistan and Palestine and, and, and other topics back to the African diaspora and its issues with U.S. imperialism. So we always talk about, we connect it to Colombia, the African uh, communities of Colombia, the, Af the majority African people in Haiti struggling for their sovereignty. So we, 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 we always make those connections because we're, we're at our core inter anti-colonial international. Yeah, and and people can go to Black Alliance for Peace website and find this information and sign up for the newsletter. Yeah, so um, you can sign up for our main news newsletter on our website, BlackAllianceForPeace.com, at the top of the website. Um, this particular Afghanistan newsletter, um, you can find it on at uh, BlackAllianceForPeace.com slash Afghanistan News Update, which you could also find featured on the Afghanistan resources page, which is at blackalliancefortpeace.com slash Afghanistan. So um, yeah. there's no, right now there's, we, we're sending it out to our solidarity network as an email, but um, we're, it's not necessarily like, you know, you, there's no way to like opt in to the, to the newsletter right now. Um, the best way to opt in really is to opt into our main newsletter and then we, we link to you with it. Sounds good. Um, you mentioned Biden and, uh, you know, in the past year, well, last year and the year before, you had Democrats in Congress talking about actually voting in both houses twice to end the war on Yemen and numerous uh, senators and Congress members talking, hinting about ending the war on Afghanistan next after they ended the war on Yemen. But of course, they could count on Trump vetoing uh, those uh, votes, and uh, now you've got the Democrats in the House, in the Senate, and in the White House. Everything should be good. The wars should be ending one by one. They should be ending a war every week. Uh, we haven't exactly seen that. What's what's gone wrong? Well, that's the big myth that the Black Lives Matter piece tries to bust is that for the, the oppressed peoples of the world who are under attack from U.S. imperialism, there's no difference between Republicans or Democrats in the United States. So, uh, you know, one just talks a little bit nicer and it sounds a bit more civilized. But, you know, even Biden, he showed up in office and a few days later, he supported him and Kamala as a, an administration, supported Jovenel Moise, the Haitian president who um, we refer to as a Haitian dictator, who is um, staying in office past his term, past February 7th, when he was supposed to be out of office. So, you know, they're supporting, the irony is that they're supporting that person who um, is not supposed to be in office past his term, and there's thousands of people in the streets of Haiti protesting him. Every week, every Sunday, there, there was, like, protests, like, massive protests. But it, when Trump was saying that he wouldn't leave office, that was, like, that was unacceptable for these Democrats. So the irony right. here and the hypocrisy is, um, you know, it's not surprising to us in our, with the work that we're doing, 
you know, but we're trying to uh, share the knowledge, share the information um, with with people in the United States and around the world, or more specifically around with people in the United States that they're that you're you're getting you're getting played. You're you know they're treating you like a chump. You know they're offering you those two thousand dollar stimulus check. You didn't get the two thousand dollars. You got fourteen thousand dollars. If you if you qualify, even you know they they made that an issue also where you have to qualify. And, um, you know, there were other things like you're not going to get free, you're not going to get cancellation of student debt. You're not going to get even a public option for healthcare. Forget about Medicare for all. You're not going to even get a public option. And these are all things that this man, Joe Biden, had, had promised. And now you're not going to get it. So um, we, you know, unfortunately, the way that the conditions in the United States are such that people would not rise up to um, fight it because there's there's the energy there, but there, it's not organized. And the reason it's not organized is because a lot of it has been demobilized by these big trade unions that keep keep the energy down. Whereas in other countries, <coughs> in other countries, when there's even a tax supposed tax reform even proposed that would devastate low and middle income people in places like Colombia. They would be up in, they are out in the streets and they shut them down. Yeah. A black we've got just a couple yes. minutes left. Black Alliance for Peace, Julie Vargas, has has been also providing a great deal of information about Colombia and what's happening in Colombia and <laughs> and the, the US role and US uh, connections to what's happening there. Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, so I mean Biden is what Right behind that plan, Colombia that uh, that just which provides billions of dollars in military aid to Colombia since the year two thousand, and um, the uh, and that means that Colombia has um, a, a military apparatus that it uses to, to repress the population, and specifically the African population and the indigenous populations are the ones that have historically been hit the most because they live in territories where there are minerals that are valuable to these multinational corporations. So they've been trying to kick these people off of their ancestral territories, and but they're resisting. They've been resisting all these years. So that's where a big part of it is. And, you know, um, yeah, so, it, you know, now, though, it's because capitalism is evolving also. So it's like neoliberal austerity is hitting everybody across the board in Colombia. So... People were out in the streets last year. People were out in the streets this year over this tax, supposed tax reform. You know, I don't know what else to call it. Like a, it's like a, it was just a devastating law for people. It would have really devastated. It would have just been very bad for working people in Colombia all around. So uh, the United States has typically used Colombia as its, um, um, as like the. Um, Using it the way like Israel is used in in West Asia to destabilize that region. So right. it is actually the nickname of Colombia. Some people call it the Israel of, of Latin America because it is brutal with its population and it's taking money and resources from and abiding by the United States. And it's and it's become a partner with with NATO, having nothing whatsoever to do with the North or the Atlantic. <laughs> Uh, Julie Vargas uh, works with Black Alliance for Peace. Uh, Julie, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you so much. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.